thank you so much for uh, coming today to visit with us. And um, we thought it would be helpful for you to talk a little bit about the personal history that brought you two together and uh, how that led to the formation of the Institute. Well, we first started discussing specifically about what became the health policy program in 1971. But we have to go back a decade to 1961 after Kennedy was elected and the King-Anderson bill, which later became part A of Medicare, was then on the agenda. And because I had a lot of elderly patients, I was an internist at the Palo Alto Clinic, I had a lot of elderly patients and at least half of them I couldn't admit to the Palo Alto Hospital because they couldn't pay. They had no health insurance, so I had to send them to the county hospital. So this seemed like a good idea to me. And uh, I was one of the founders of an organization called the Bay Area Committee for Medical Aid to the Aged. That had an article in Newsweek uh, about it, and that got a lot of people paying some attention to what we were saying. Didn't have any influence on what happened, but I testified before the Ways and Means Committee. The AF of LCIO would send me materials that I could use in my debates against other doctors. Uh, and I got more and more interested in how did Washington work? And Lester Breslow, who was deputy director of the California Health Department or head of the Chronic Disease Division, was a friend of mine. And I said to Lester, I understand you're going to Washington and I'd like to go with you and learn how the government works. He said, I'm not going, but I'm recommending you for the job. He recommended me to his friend, Leona Baumgartner, who'd been health commissioner of New York City and knew less well. She had gone to the Agency for International Development as the head of an office, a staff office, that included education, health, community development, research. Uh, and strangely enough, she offered me the job. I knew nothing about international health, but I'd worked a lot with people in the public health service, and she wanted to get them much more involved in international health. Uh, well, I did that for two years. I was offered the job to go to India to be the public health advisor, uh, the U.S. health advisor to the Indians. And uh, I said, with five kids, I'm not going to India. It's fine for me, but, you know, it's not for my kids. So I was going to go back to Palo Alto. Wilbur Cohen, who was then assistant secretary in HEW, called me in April and said, Medicare is going to pass and could you come and spend a year, year and a half working with us to work with the doctors to get them to cooperate on Medicare and uh, to set the policies. Uh, so I called Bob Jamplis at the clinic, got another year's leave of absence, and when I went to the department, which was like the first of August, John Gardner was the secretary. My office was right next to his, and so I began to get very much involved, first of all, in developing policies on family planning, working to plan and organize and coordinate the White House Conference on Health, which the president wanted to have, and then a whole bunch of policies. Uh, the most important of those, one was health manpower, uh, prescription drugs. I chaired a task force on prescription drugs which Milt Silverman was the executive director of. I was very much involved in desegregating a thousand hospitals with Medicare money. I wasn't in charge of it, but I was very much involved in that. So I'd gotten very much involved in health policy. It's important but, to remember that Phil was the first assistant secretary for health. They had just created the correct. Department of HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare, because it had all been bits and pieces of Social Security here and something else public health service there and all of that. FDA over here, right, yeah. yeah and well, also, the, it was a big surprise to everybody that John Gardner had you know, recommended me to the White House for the job uh, because Ed Dempsey, who'd been a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, was the special assistant for health. And uh, he was, everybody thought he would be appointed assistant secretary. But when he would be in meetings with John Gardner, let's say talking about health manpower, John Gardner wanted the meeting to end and he would pull his tie up like this. 
And Ed Dempsey <laughs> just kept talking. He was a professor, and he just, and I would thing. recognize this, and so I didn't keep talking. And so it was surprising to everybody that this, you know, absolutely inexperienced person would be appointed the first assistant secretary for health in HEW with all kinds of things going on. I mean, more health legislation was enacted in 1965, the year I was appointed, than in all the previous Congresses put together. Okay, so it tells you how busy we were. It's yeah. important to remember that, uh, in a way, Barry Goldwater passed Medicare because when he ran for president oh. in 1964, he carried down 50 Republican, it was such a bust, yeah. that he carried down 50 Republican members of the House, and that's when Wilbur Cohen and they all thought, yeah. well, ha-ha, here's our chance to pass the most important piece of medical legislation in ever. In the country, yeah. sure. And they passed civil rights the year before, after Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson came in, and everybody thought of him, he's a southerner, he's voted against every previous civil rights bill except the 57 bill in, in the Senate, which was only a very weak civil rights bill. So nobody expected him to, one, declare war on poverty, to say Medicare is his first priority after he was elected. Uh, so it was, it was a very uh, activist, unbelievably activist period of progressive social legislation, making up for the New Deal and going beyond the New Deal. I mean, civil rights, the New Deal never was into civil rights. Poverty, they never really were into what he wanted to do on poverty. And we were doing stuff on environment, uh, food safety, uh, water, uh, I mean, just a whole range of things that I knew nothing about, but, you know. So that's how it started. And then, when I was leaving the department, Humphrey lost to Nixon. Lou had been asked to help Bob Finch out. And so he came to Washington, and we began to have a series of conversations when he was advising the new secretary. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that I'd known the Lee family since I was a teenager. Phil's younger brother was yeah. a good friend of mine. We'd gone hiking in the Sierra at the end of World War II on one of the craziest trips I ever took in my life. And, uh, and so, and I had stayed in the Lee's house in Palo Alto with Huey, his younger brother, who became, by the way, a very distinguished surgeon. And so when I got back to Washington, here's somebody that I knew. And Lou didn't know anything about health policy. <laughs> Zero. And there well, was no assistant secretary for health. And, and so I was already committed to going to UC. What had happened point. was that I'd gotten home from running the Peace Corps in Malaysia in 1964 in the Kennedy administration and then Johnson. And then I, you know, I came home and I was working on environmental stuff and uh, not involved with health at all. All I knew about health was we'd had 40 nurses in, in, in Malaysia, which was, they were wonderful by the way, Peace Corps volunteers. But Anyways, but here Nixon gets elected and Bob Finch, who's the lieutenant governor who I've been working, doing stuff with, Bob Finch had been Nixon's chief of staff when he was vice president. And the story is, and I'm not sure it's true, is that he actually offered, Nixon actually offered Finch the job of vice president instead of That's Spiro true. Agnew. Agnew, of oh, course, really? That's ended up having to resign mm. and barely escaped going to jail. So uh, anyway, they. He asked Finch, the president asked Finch, or president-to-be, Nixon, you know, what job do you want? And Bob Finch said, secretary of HEW. And then he turned to me and another good friend of his, uh, Jack Veneman from Modesto, a, a legislator, and said, would you guys come back to Washington and help me get started? And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a local boy. I'm not a Potomac guy. I'll come back for a month. And so I got there, and there's Phil. And Phil was, we actually tried to persuade Phil to stay, but he didn't want to stay for good reasons. He didn't think Richard Nixon was, right. was so outstanding. Uh, and besides, <laughs> the University of California offered Phil the job as the chancellor. Uh, and so Phil, and that, by the way, came to a vote before the Board of Regents, and there were a bunch of people that didn't want Phil. And Jack Veneman called up his pal Bob Monaghan, then the Speaker of the Assembly, and said, Phil, he's a really good guy. Make him the Chancellor at UCSF. And didn't you get... 13 to 12 was the <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and they, you, know, you only have to win no, by one vote. That's no, the no, When they told me that I would, 
you know, been selected, Charlie Hitch, who was then the president, did right. not mention this. I only learned about it three years later when I resigned. And people said, well, that vote was only 13 to 12. <laughs> uh, but then what happened when I was chancellor, I mean, there were a lot of things you had to do. But Charlie Hitch, who's the president, asked me to be the inside guy on a health science bond issue. That was in uh, 69, or 70, 70. Uh, and Edgar Kaiser was the outside, and he put up a lot of money to get this bond issue passed. And I was campaigning all over the state, and we lost. Reagan never supported it, and uh, because he didn't want me to be chancellor. I mean, that's part of the reason. And then we had, the next year, a program approved by the UCSF faculty, by the statewide faculty, academic senate, president's office, board of regents, the legislature, six FTEs, faculty positions, and a deanship. And the university budget was probably a billion dollars, and this was maybe a couple hundred thousand. Reagan blue penciled it. Out of a billion dollars, he blue penciled these six positions. So I said to Charlie Hitch after this was in the fall of 71. I said, look, it doesn't help to have me to be the chancellor. And not long after that, I had a bowel obstruction. So then there was a good reason for me to, you know, resign. Right. Uh, I couldn't say, well, I'm resigning because of Reagan. Right. Uh, right. But so then I was going to be out of the chancellor job by the fall of 72. I knew I wanted to leave by the fall of 71. And that's when Lou and I first started conversation. He'd left the Nixon administration, and we began to talk about is there some, we were both very dissatisfied when we asked people in universities, was there any new ideas? Did they have any idea for leg No new ideas. I mean, it was pitiful. And the only people doing anything on policy were economists, like Vic Fuchs, Marty Feldstein at Harvard, and a few other people. Uh, so we started talking about, is there something we could do? Here's a lawyer and a doctor. None of them, doctors weren't doing health policy, they were just lobbying, just the AMA. So that's how we began the conversations about what became the health policy program, which then became the Institute. And, and I should mention that you know, I find myself in Washington, and as Phil mentioned earlier, uh, we were going to appoint Assistant Secretary for Health. First off, I was going to leave and come back home, but my job was to find the Assistant Secretary. So we get a good guy, John Knowles from Mass General Hospital, and the AMA had given seven million bucks to Richard Nixon, and they thought they had a veto power over any Assistant Secretary for Health, and they didn't like Knowles because he'd been involved in national health insurance with Ted Kennedy. So yeah. so we had no uh, assistant secretary for health to succeed Phil for a whole year. Well, I sort of fell into the job as long as, as, long as my, with my own job, which was assistant secretary for planning and evaluation, because by that time Finch had persuaded me and Veneman to stay. So the three of us were trying to run the department. And um, so I got in the health business, and of course I knew nothing about it, so then I would start calling up Phil. You know, like, who's this guy? And, who's, and Phil called me one time and said, by the way, the because uh, Phil had had to try to get the Surgeon General of the United States under control, because that was the public health service. Yeah, yeah. And Phil called me up and said, your Surgeon General is showing up in uniform in the Congress. You better stop that, or you'll lose control yeah, over him. unbelievable. Uh, so I, and I even came out to San Francisco and met with Phil and his brother Huey and Barrett Weber, and, to say, you know, tell me what, what I'm supposed to be doing back there. And then when I couldn't stand Nixon any longer, and, and I had written Nixon's national health insurance proposal, but I couldn't stand Nixon any longer in the Vietnam War. So I quit in 71. But you also did, with Paul Elwood, the HMO you know, legislation. Uh, I mean, it became the HMO legislation. It really wasn't called HMOs originally. Well, with, we, but, we no. wrote it, you know, I wrote a a speech for the secretary introducing the idea of health maintenance organizations. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to get out of there, and, and uh, so I did, but of course I didn't have a job, and I called up Phil, and Phil and another friend found me, uh, as a political refugee, found me a place 
uh, at the Bolt Hall at, at the law school thing. And then uh, when he was at teaching at Berkeley, he reconnected with Mike Parker, who'd been a deputy assistant secretary for legislation in the Kennedy administration and early in the Johnson administration, but was helped Lou teach a little bit about health policy in the law school at Berkeley. And Mike had been the lobbyist for Kaiser, so when we were doing right. HMOs, yeah, that's I when saw him really, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And Mike had also worked with Cohen, I think, hadn't he at one point with Wilbur Cohen? Um, Did what with? Worked with Wilbur Cohen? Oh yeah, he was in the department in Wilbur's... He was the deputy assistant secretary. secretary. Right. So well, he yeah, did. he was in, in legislation and Mike worked for Wilbur directly. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But then in the, in the spring, well in, the, in September, when I left, Margaret Mahoney, who was at the Commonwealth Fund, gave Lou some money to kind of look around the country about what was going on in health policy. And uh, what we found out was nobody was doing very much except for these few economists. And I, uh, I was reporting back to Phil what I was finding out. And by the way, one of the things I found out, a wonderful guy, health economist, said there are two kinds of econo health economists. There's the ones that have been sick yeah, right. and the ones that haven't been sick. And Marty Feldstein hadn't been sick, yeah, right. so he, he wasn't for any form of national health insurance except <laughs> no. catastrophic insurance. And another guy whose name I've not forgotten had, had chronic illness and was for all for some form of national health right. insurance. Right, yeah, that was the guy in New York. I forget his yeah. name, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as you were kind of taking the pulse of the country and it was clear that you were pretty dissatisfied, you both obviously started to engage in around developing where well, Margaret Canada. Mahoney then, after Lou did this survey, she then gave us a grant. Uh, she moved from the Commonwealth Fund to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and gave us a grant to actually create the health policy program. Uh, and Milt Silverman was involved, Mike Parker was involved, Mary Lee Ingbar, who was an economist, uh, was, but she wasn't a central person but she was involved. And then what turned out to be the biggest break, uh, the next year, or shortly after I resigned, Al Johnson resigned as president of the University of South He was a Jesuit priest, and as Lou said, a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. <laughs> and we didn't care about the vow of chastity. <laughs> but. And we I had were, given the, uh, I had been the speaker at Al's inauguration yeah. when he became president of USA. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize Because he needed some Irishman from San Francisco to, yep. that had a federal job. So uh, we all knew Al and, and he came on over. Yeah, he had accepted a job at Berkeley running a uh, ethics program, but that didn't work out. So he was without a job. And so with a vow of poverty, we could easily offer him a job. I mean, he was a distinguished philosopher, but knew nothing about health. Uh, and so we brought him to the health policy program early on. And the first thing he did was want to really learn about what was going on clinically. So he made rounds with the surgeons, made rounds with the pediatricians, particularly in neonatal intensive care, with people at San Francisco General Hospital in the emergency room, so he became very popular and actually helped make the health program popular because he was really relating to clinicians. And I had felt that we had to relate to the clinical parts of the campus where the health policy program wasn't going to go anywhere. And Al was absolutely instrumental in making that happen. By the way, it's important to remember that none of this would have happened, in my opinion, if Phil had not been the chancellor before us. And Phil, before he steps down as the chancellor, gets 1326 Third Avenue, a house that we could go into. He gets a full-time equivalent job, which he can, so they're supporting him, uh, and lines up all the kinds of things. And it wasn't until I got there that I realized that there were that Phil had been a revolutionary as chancellor because suddenly there were women getting into the medical school and there were Latinos getting into the medical Blacks, school yeah. and there were black guys getting into the medical school. 
they couldn't touch us because Phil had kind of created this center that, that and they they couldn't confront us and just throw us out. So because we were, I was a tenured gets, faculty at the when I got an appointment, I was appointed at the highest level. You know, so it was like a step six, uh, and that was the so. And as a tenured professor, they couldn't do anything about it. No. Well, um, obviously, uh, you also began to uh, capture some other resources to support. I mean, the university provided you with very, I mean, a starting point, but but but. A, well, Robert Wood Johnson gave us this grant, mm -hmm. uh, which Lou and I. Let me interrupt a second. Yeah. All of this is because of Phil. Maggie Mahoney <laughs> is a great friend of Phil's. She not only has put up the money for me to tutor around the country, she then moves over to this brand new foundation, Robert Wood Johnson, that's got a billion bucks yeah. from the Johnson and Johnson and uh, they don't know what to do with the money uh, and Phil and Maggie explained to the Johnson Foundation that we would be very good people to have that some of that money. Well David Rogers who was the president yes, had been Dean at Johns Hopkins. He'd been at Vanderbilt before that as Chairman of Medicine. When I ran the Bay Area Committee for Medical Aid to the Aged in 61, I sent a letter to all the chairmen of medicine in the country. Two of them supported the King-Anderson bill. David Rogers was one, Tom Brem at USC was the other. So I had known David for a long time, and we'd been very supportive on civil rights issues, for example. And he, they were pushing him out of Hopkins because he was too aggressive on civil rights. Uh -huh. uh, and that was even in the 70s, after the Civil Rights Act, after the Voting Amazing. Rights Act, really after crazy. Medicare desegregated the, the Hopkins faculty did not want to have black students. Uh, so he was made president, uh, so we had a sympathetic president of Robert Wood Johnson mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, well then Al joined us and one of the things that people Ethical issues were rising to the top of the national agenda. Tuskegee, and then there was research related to fetal research. And the conservatives didn't want fetal research, and the liberals didn't want Tuskegee. So there were both conservatives and liberals in Congress and outside wanted a focus on this. And so Al was in, um, involved in stuff fairly quickly. Uh, because he was in the health policy program. He was a professor of ethics. Uh, and his second year, we had him go back to Washington. He was chairman of the board of Georgetown, but he spent the year at the uh, Library of Medicine really learning about health policy, in addition to what he learned clinically at our place. And, uh, but then he wanted to get married to the, uh, uh, he was she was the secretary uh, to the president of the university, yeah, of Georgetown, uh, and uh, so then he had to, you know, give up his vow of poverty. So then we had to get a hard money position <laughs> for him, uh, which uh, we did. Uh, you did. <laughs> well, I mean, Julie Crevens, I think, gave us the or Holly Smith did actually, yeah. <laughs> gave us a position because it was very clear <coughs> that here was a spectacular. And then numerous uh, people wanted to work with him as fellows. So that's where we first got into the fellowship part. When we started the health policy program, we were gonna focus on what we called research, but it was more policy analysis, and it was technical assistance to policymakers. We had set up a Washington office uh, and uh, we were working a lot with particular people in Congress, uh, some people in OMB uh, and in the department, uh, and we would make the rounds and find out, okay, what are the issues that you're concerned about? Uh, and so we were focusing on, for example, well, Milt and I had worked on the Task Force on Prescription Drugs, Milt Silverman. Uh, in the Johnson administration and written this work, the task force report. And so when we came to UCSF, Milt was recruited by the pharmacy faculty. He was a PhD in pharmacology and a journalist. 
And so one area of our research was prescription drugs. And there were a lot of people, Ribicoff and others in Congress, who had a big interest in that. So we were providing some technical assistance around those issues. By but, the way, that was extraordinarily important. It was Phil's idea that we should have a Washington office and put Steve Strickland in it. Well, and I was all for that because both Phil and I were hoping the national health insurance we pass. thought it was going to pass. <laughs> because everybody had a proposal for national health insurance, yeah, right. even the AMA. I mean, yeah. and uh, Alice Rivlin, had, who, my predecessor in HEW, had written a story saying it's not now a question of, of whether national health insurance, it's of what kind. And they were and, Paul and, when, yeah, and, and Paul Rogers was the chairman of the health committee, and he was holding hearings on national health insurance, and we helped him with the hearings. But we just thought, which is when you think it took another 40 years until Obama was able to pass something, but we thought at the time, you know, that we were going to get some national health insurance legislation, and we wanted to be part of that and help them. One thing we discovered the hard way was that a lot of the staff people in the Congress resented our access to their bosses, yeah. like yeah. Paul Rogers. And I remember later on when Lauren LeRoy was representing us in Washington. I went with her to the Senate Finance Committee that was to hear any national health insurance. And the guy was so rude to Lauren and Beth, you know, I almost went over the desk and to slug him. <laughs> I mean, it was just uncalled for. And he was not, I said, you're not the senator. You're, nobody elected you. What are you talking about? Do you remember that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. I forget his name now. But it was terrible because these staff people in the Congress we're trying to control access to their bosses. So they could be the influentials. Yeah. yeah. But we had good relationships with Senator Javits, for example, who was very important on these issues, with Senator Kennedy, uh, who was, you know, ascending fairly rapidly in that period, uh, Teddy Kennedy. Uh, in the House, mainly Paul Rogers, and uh, then the people on the Ways and Means Committee. And there were some moderate Republicans in those days. Very much so. Dave, the guy from Minnesota. Dave Dernberger. Dernberger. Yeah, yeah. And there were a whole bunch of moderate Republicans. That's why Nixon had proposed national health insurance, because he wanted to be in the middle of the political spectrum. Uh, he didn't really care about it, but he wanted to be in the game. Uh, so that was, that. I mean, we had these, and with the relationship in Sacramento, for example, we also had people like John Garamendi, who chaired the health committee, and again, the lobbyists for UC were very frustrated or very concerned about were we going to undermine what were some very backward policies of the university. And we said, well, we're not going to do that. And we didn't. But uh, they were very worried that we were and that we would do the same thing in Washington. It's important um, to remember, if you looked in the Washington phone book for the District of Columbia, there were two listings for the University of California. One was for the whole university, na namely these lobbyists, and the other one was for the for what was then the health policy program. program. Yeah. Well, they really resented that, and of course what they resented is that we had far better access to the people in the Congress than they did. Uh, and so they, well, it goes back to when, yeah. when we got this million dollar grant, thanks to Phil from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Phil was in Israel, and uh, I got a call from Charlie Hitch, the head of the university, uh, saying that, that, that our health people want to veto the grant. They don't want the university taking a million, million. $1.2 million yeah. for you guys. And so to describe what we then had to do, Phil came back and we got the grant, but... Well, Lou reached agreement with Charlie Hitch that we would make a report once a month to I the chancellor. To and I had to go meet every month with Frank Suey, who succeeded me and did a very, very good job, and send him a written report and it was so boring that finally Frank said, you know, let's, you Stop. know, you don't need to do this anymore. But the it other thing... It felt secure that, that you were not going to do the wrong thing. Yeah, the thing, several things that emerged out of this. One, we realized, one, the Al Johnson thing was going gangbusters. And he was getting money left and right. He got a money about a million and a half for a fellowship program. So he began in the fellows that he had over time. Then he got probably grants from five other foundations. I mean, this was a, a very hot area. Uh, and he was, at that point, one of the founders 
of bioethics nationally with the people at Georgetown. And there were a few other people, but he was then, because he was in a med school, he was in a health policy program, mm -hmm. uh, and he was extremely good teacher. He was very good mentor with the fellows, and he could write stuff that was very good. And you wrote a paper with him very early. Yes, I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, was, it was a politician and an ethicist trying to figure out what has ethics got to do, do with, with public him. policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. that was very early. Uh, but these fellows, of the first probably half a dozen, every one of them is either a professor in some university or they're running like the American College of Physicians, you know, like Carol Castle uh, was his first fellow. Uh, and people came from all over the country wanting to work with Al. It wasn't just people at UCSF. And that was true of Phil. I mean, you know, there's just a whole squadron of doctors and public policy people around the United States uh, that owe their whole training and everything to the to Phil and the health policy program, which later became the Institute. In my case, it, it's sort of interesting. Uh, a young guy who was a grandson of a friend of mine came and, and said he wanted to work with me, Bob Friedman. And uh, I said, well, we don't have a job. So Phil said, well, we'll, we'll create a fellowship program. I think we paid him $400 a so month at that. the start. Bob Friedman is the founder and now chair of the leading organization in the United States uh, that looks at building assets for the poor. Uh, it's called the Center for Enterprise Development. Uh, his successor was a guy named David Elwood. Uh, David was a young economist who was going to go back and get a PhD in e economics and was interested in health policy. David Elwood is now the dean of the Harvard School. But he was the, the Kennedy son School. of Paul Elwood, who worked with Lou yeah, on the I know him since he was a 14-year-old kid. He's now dean of the Kennedy School at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it, Peter Bedetti was another example. Peter Bedetti was a law student. He was an MD. Yeah. He was in the law school at Berkeley, and the dean calls Lou up and said, "We got this the smartest guy in our class, uh, and we'd like to have him work with us. Could you talk with him? Because we and he's a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we talked with him, and Bedetti came to work with us, not with the dean of the law school. <laughs> and of course, we got some money to do that." And Bedetti's now in charge of catching Medicare for all the fraud, fraud and abuse. Fraud yeah. and abuse, yeah. yes, yeah. In, in DC. Well, and so we also got grants yeah. and with, with Phyllis Fetto to help us to. Shirley Kressel, Mike Parker. The health yeah. policy program. Uh, the health, we gradually, health planning is a, in the early period, when we were doing a lot of this technical assistance uh, and public policy, I mean, t we were doing the what I'd say, policy analysis, not real research. Because Lou and I were neither one of us researchers. Well, you were better than I was. Yeah, but I was, <laughs> yes. you know, we did, we I was did zero. fairly good, but you know. But then, uh, we realized that we really needed to recruit some really top-notch economists. Uh, Mary Lee Ingbar was going back to Harvard with her husband, uh, and there was a grant solicitation from what was the National Center for Health Services Research, which had been established when I was Assistant Secretary for Health. Uh, and this was a national competition, and it was to focus on HMOs, or organized systems. Uh, and we put in a proposal. Uh, we got the grant. We beat out people who thought they were going to beat us out, like Brandeis and Harvard and... Paul Elwood and Mundo. And, you know... <laughs> Uh, University of Pennsylvania, but so with that money, one we recruited Hal Luft, who was uh, had done a his dissertation had been on pov poverty and health, which we were very attracted with that. He was also studying uh, healthcare and HMOs, and he would written a monograph, or he was writing one on that. He'd been trained by Marty Feldstein. Uh, and then we were going. We also recruited Ann Satowski, who was at the Palo Alto Clinic, and who had one of the major things she was doing was looking at the cost of medical care. And what she found out was in the seventies, the cost went from what she called little ticket items to big ticket items. 
it went from appendectomy and chest x-ray and EKG and lab work to hip replacement and then bypass graft surgery. I mean, these were very, and it, I mean, it, it's been even compounded since then. But she did the fundamental work on that. And then Hal began to look at quality and the relationship of outcomes of care with bypass graft surgery to volume. And again, he, this created a whole area of research. And he's still the preeminent researcher in the relationship of volume to quality. And he found with bypass graft surgery, if he did more, he had lower mortality. And was the question, did you get the patients because you did it better, or did you get better because you did all the surgery? Uh, and uh, so those were two, with that funding, and then we recruited Helene Lipton to not be a faculty person, but to coordinate this program. And she, of course, has become a preeminent sociologist, full-time faculty member in pharmacy, and one of the leading people on prescription drugs. She sort of succeeded Milt. Milt and I were looking at this for a long time, and then she and I looked at it starting, this was began by the 80s, but then we moved from this more uh, technical assistant policy analysis to real research and making very significant contributions. The other thing, that two things that were evolving was the development, and this began with a big emphasis later, was on training, postdoctoral training. As an organized, well then we got approved as an organized research unit also, but as we began, uh, we, we got a real name, by the way, then. Yeah, we, we went did. from Health Policy Program to be the Institute to for Health Policy, policy Studies. studies. When, and then we had to go through UCSF faculty, uh, and then administration, because we no longer, and then system-wide, and then the regions had to approve us as an organized research unit. Uh, uh, and that helped us become much more recognized in the university uh, because people realized we passed this very rigorous examination uh, and part of that was because of this much stronger emphasis on research but then we began to do more on the training side uh, and that was the I would say the second major area uh, that, I mean, areas that we were involved in research, health professions, healthcare regulation and planning, uh, prescription drugs, uh, health insurance, costs of medical care related issues. Uh, and then the, we began to use, train the clinical scholars that were funded by Robert Wood Johnson. That was separate from the Institute, but many of them came to us to be their mentors. And then we developed the Pew program, which was a major postdoctoral training program. Uh, we did it also with the School of Public Health at Berkeley and the Institute for Health and Aging, but the source of it was the institute. You know, I think Phil and I have talked about this, that when you looking back, something that we really didn't discuss at the start but turned out to perhaps be the greatest accomplishment of the institute was that we trained a whole generation, yeah. or they trained themselves, but uh, of people that would go on, not just the ones we've mentioned, but because Phil was a doctor, we had medical students and doctors who wanted to get into the health policy business, and, and they could come, like Neil Halfon, who was a pediatrician, uh, Peter Bedetti, who was a lawyer. Peter Bedetti. Bedetti and, and, Connie you know. Kellum, who came along as an intern. Connie, well, yes. She was a med student she was a, and started working with Bob Durzon and then... You know, and I remember one of the nicest days of my life when Connie asked me to put on a some robe over my head and be her parent or sponsor when she graduated. And yeah, this yeah. Is, we had this wonderful connection with younger people and uh, when Phil realized that uh, that to say the least, I was never going to be a researcher. Uh, we hired uh, uh, Paul from Berkeley and uh, to come and be my... Paul Nuitschek. Yeah, Paul Nuitschek yeah. to be my uh, assistant. And then, thanks to Paul, we started writing 
papers about poverty and health and, and that kind of thing. And of course, Paul has ended up one of the leading Absolutely. churches on children in the country. He's just retired. But uh, the other area that we developed, I had this interest because I wrote the first family planning policies in the State Department, then in HEW. So I wanted to do something on that. Uh, and uh, we got Don Minkler. We had uh, Ann Murray, who was the first person to run that program for us. She went to the Hewlett Foundation. Then, of course, we got some money from the Hewlett Foundation. But the Cowell Foundation gave us the first money to do something in family planning. Uh, and that program, 40 years later, is still Claire Brindis, who's now the director of the Institute, ran that program with Don Minkler for years. But we continued to be very innovative researchers and technical assistants. And that, that, that one goes back to what Phil had done in the 1960s yeah, right, yeah. in family planning and, yeah. and, and foreign aid. So it's, it's, and on the prescription drugs, for example, Helene Lipton is still doing that. Uh, and the areas, I mean, quality of care and costs are still an issue. So that, although we haven't been as involved, obviously, for a number of years, I went back to Washington in 93 to be the Assistant Secretary for Health for the second time. Uh, and Lou, when did you run, leave to run that statewide thing in California tomorrow? Uh, in the late, in the mid 80s. Well, it was late 80s, wasn't it? Later, yeah, yeah. yeah because I, I, I stayed on as still, we taught at Berkeley. Right, the whole right, right. Neil Halfon and With Paul the joint, joint medical program. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Uh, but so by that, I was phasing myself out by the 1980s, and then uh, Clinton gets elected, and Phil, they look around the United States, and they said, why don't we take the first assistant secretary for health and put him back in his old job? And at that time, both Phil and I thought, well, here comes a chance for national health insurance, because... Uh, we were very you know, optimistic. In I, I, had, I had known Hillary Clinton from doing work with her in education years before, and I thought, well, you know, this is great, and Phil's going to go back there, and we're really going to get a shot at national uh -huh. health insurance, and it turned out that they completely blew it. Yeah, I went to a meeting. <laughs> Donna Shalala asked me, I was at a meeting on the Academy of Social Insurance, or, and she called me up and said, Phil, I want you to come over and go with me to the White House. I said, fine. Uh, she said, they're going to have a meeting on health care reform. Uh, so we drive in. I have no federal ID. They didn't even stop the car. We just, you know, and walk into the White House. Nobody checks me out at all. We go to the meeting in the, in the Roosevelt Room, and Hillary's there, among others. So after the meeting, I go up and I introduce myself, and I said, Lou Butler said I should introduce myself to you. Uh, I was just an advisor. But then she and I got along very well, but didn't have any impact. Because Ira Magaziner had determined what he wanted. It was all settled beforehand. And unfortunately, nobody trusted him, especially in Congress. And they drew up a thousand page bill and it arrived dead on arrival in the US Congress. Well, one of the people who actually drafted the bill was Peter Benetti. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and by, he, by the way, we ought to mention, during all of this time, there was teaching going on. I mean, actually, yes, classroom yeah. teaching. Phil was giving lectures and, and things for what he Well, at first, I mean, the teaching, Al Johnson and I started teaching a course in medical ethics or bioethics. Right. You know, I would do the health piece and he would do the ethics piece. And I would be learning about ethics as he was talking, you know. <laughs> uh, and then we did some general courses on health policy. But we thought the students were not as interested, so we would only do postdocs. And so for a while we didn't teach undergraduates, all I taught in some general courses on community health. Uh, but then gradually, more and more med students and other students got interested. So we began to develop some courses. And of course now, uh, Dan Dohan has done a very, very good job of developing that area and developing a graduate program. Uh, we had this postdoc program. 
But as an organized research unit, you didn't do graduate education. You could do post graduate education had to be a department. Uh, so we didn't, you know, do that. But we ended up doing. I mean, like Peter Bedetti and I taught a course at Bolt Law School at Berkeley, and then he and I started with the with a special class of medical students that were taking five years because they were interested in health policy, and then yeah, that was a, the joint medical Neil program. Lou and Neil, Neil Halfon and Benetti and, and Paul Nuchek were and key in getting that program off the ground. So we taught at Berkeley, the three of us, which was to a special class of 12 students. And I think the responsibilities of medical practice was very popular among the medical students. Right, there. eventually, yeah. That was a yeah. very interdisciplinary right, yeah. kind of group. By the way, yeah. there, there were some things that were not in the plan at all. I remember uh, Phil came back one day and they'd been talking to a bunch of young doctors out at General Hospital and they had this mysterious disease and and Phil was telling me about it and I, I remember thinking, come on Phil, we're trying to do health policy, what, what, what are you doing out there? Well, of course, Phil, if a doctor's got a problem, Phil's going to help him. And of course, this went on and on and on, and guess what? It's AIDS. Well, also, Diane Feinstein appointed me as chairman of the Health Commission, <coughs> and we appointed Dave Werdiger. They created the Health Commission the year before. Diane had been against it, but, you know, the public, it was a popular vote. What I remember is when you came back, there was no name for this disease. There was a cancer that was right. showing up in the name yeah, of which Kaposi I, sarcoma. Yes. But there was no name for the disease, but it was clearly spreading like mad, and it was horrible, and people were dying. And these young doctors, like Volberding, needed someone to pay attention to them, and it turned out to be Phil. Well, they also, I mean, Diane Feinstein gave the first money of any government agency to fund a program for AIDS at San Francisco General. Uh, <clears throat> and so you got to give her credit. Absolutely. Merle Sandy then asked us, when the, it became called AIDS, uh, first it was called another name, and then it was called AIDS funding. But he asked me, he said, could we look at what it's costing? So we asked Ann Satosky to take a look at this. And so she did a study of what we call the San Francisco model, which was an organized outpatient program, an organized inpatient, separate unit for AIDS patients, home care, hospice care, all coordinated. And uh, in New York and Philadelphia and Chicago and other places, they put people in the hospital. Uh, the costs of the San Francisco model were less than half what it was in New York or Washington or Philadelphia. So the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Merv Silverman and I, who had been health director, went to, again, David Rogers and said, you should fund a demonstration. So they gave us, I don't know, $15 million to run an 11-city demonstration Merv Silverman ran it, we coordinated it from the Institute, uh, and they then, these demonstrations led to what became the Ryan White program, which is still federal policy on AIDS. Uh, and there was another example of Ann Satofsky's very, you know, working with only one other research assistant, figuring the thing out, gathering the data, it was the cost differences that sold the program. Uh, but that was a very important contribution. Uh, and by the way, the politics was unbelievably difficult. Uh, so the mayor, Diane Feinstein, has the, has the Public Health Commission, makes Phil the chairman of the commission, and guess what he has to do? He has to close the bathhouses. Right. And there's just, you can't believe the screaming and yelling about you're telling us how to behave and all this kind of, but by that time they realized how the disease was being transmitted. Yeah. And that was particularly in the gay community and, you know, the, uh, the IV drug problem was not as evident at that, in that early period, which is later. It was mostly course, in New York too, wasn't it? The East well, Coast. it's become, 
you know. The big, I mean, it was also in San Francisco, it was a problem. I didn't. But, oh yeah. But it was, uh, it's now become the major mode of transmission. Uh, not just in New York and the East, but in the South. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with Peter Bedetti. Peter, uh, after the uh, uh, original, he ran our Washington office, then he went to work for Congress, and after they institute policies to control hospital costs, this was uh, early in the Reagan administration actually, uh, it was interesting because it was not what you'd think they would do. But the secretary had been a senator from Pennsylvania uh, and had some ideas about what should be done. And they developed what eventually became DRGs, Diagnostic Related Groups, to control hospital costs, which it did. Uh, then they decided that they wanted to, physician costs were going up very rapidly. But Deddy was on Waxman's staff. They'd set up this commission and they asked me to be a member and I said, it looks like it's all AMA and I won't be a member. And they said, well, what would it take? And I said, well, appoint a new commission. <laughs> so they did that and then they, they, Karen Davis was on it, Uwe Reinhardt was on it, uh, Bob Butler, who'd been head of NIA, was on it. Uh, and so I said, okay. So then I had to chair a commission on physician payment in the Medicare program, the Physician Payment Review Commission. And uh, so we got, you know, drawing on what we'd done at the Institute, I was, you know, reasonably familiar with the issues, although I hadn't done any research myself at all on them. Uh, John Eisenberg was another key member of that commission. Mm. Uh, but I wanted to get a report out, which we did in less than six months, our first report. In 89, uh, we had, we made recommendations to Congress about what they should do about physician payment. And it was to increase payment to primary care and reduce payment for specialists. It was to, uh, uh, you know, there were, one of the other things we included was an expenditure target. To, if the expenses went above a certain level, physicians got less money the next year. Well, they changed that a little bit in Congress and called it a volume performance standard. Uh, then, uh, so, but that's what we were doing for the elderly. We just wanted to make sure that everybody, there was adequate payment. So that there was a, doing some for the elderly, doing some for the doctors, because the AMA even supported more money for primary care and less for the specialists. But eventually that got reversed in the political process. But so that we recommended in 89, those policies had to be adopted or implemented by HICFA, Healthcare Financing Administration, in 1992 to 96. Well, I was in the department by that time, but the people who ran it in the Healthcare Financing Administration never asked me anything about it. Because they wanted, again, it's the same old thing, Luke. Yeah. They wanted to decide. They didn't want me giving them advice. You know, it, it turned out, because yeah. both Phil and I were members of the Institute of Medicine, I think I got in because they were embarrassed. They needed some Republicans, and I was a modern Republican on paper. So anyway, we're in the Institute of Medicine doing things with them. And at one point, uh, yeah, part of what we've been doing is trying to evaluate medical procedures, you know, what succeeds, oh, yeah. what's worth yeah. it, how much does it cost, and of course we had a care for chronic kid kidney failure that was costing a three billion sure. bucks a yeah. year for something like seven, 70,000 people. So uh, the Institute of Medicine wanted to have an evaluation, or a committee, to look at the evaluation of mortality coming from hospitals that were doing procedures, heart procedures basically. Not heart transplants, but basically bypass, coronary surgery, bypass yeah. and surgery and all of that. Valve so surgery. I ended up as the chairman of that committee of the Institute of Medicine and I said I won't take the job unless uh, you put Pedetti on there with me because I need a doctor uh, who's a friend. 
and Ralph Nader's people showed up and there was this huge hullabaloo because frankly the hospitals didn't want to be evaluated. And they said, you know, we have higher risk patients and that's why our records aren't as good. I mean, there was all of this resistance to asking the question, what's working and how much does it cost and could we do it better? Uh, and in various places, including that one, we kept trying to say, let's evaluate what doctors are doing. Because we, you know, the medical, when I was there, it was, it was 12 to 14 percent of the gross national product. And by the time we got going, it was got up to 18 percent where it is now. Oh, yeah. What do you want others to know about the Institute? I think you've been, you've been addressing that all along. I yeah, mean, well, I think Philip R. Lee, for whom the Institute is named, should answer the question. Well, I think that, I mean, to me, the evolution from our leadership to Hal Luff's leadership, very strong emphasis on research, Claire's leadership currently, very strong links to clinical departments and engaging many more of the clinicians in the process uh, and also getting as much broader interest in the education elements from health policy and Dan Dohan's working in that area. So I think it's, it is evolving. Uh, and of course we now see the political impasse, but that doesn't stop the need in many of these other areas like in family planning for the kind of research that we've been doing. Uh, prescription drugs, the things that Helene has been doing. The things that have been done on AIDS internationally. I mean, they've gone globally as well as domestically. So it's still a very dynamic institution. And I think the evolution of the leadership uh, has been very, very... I mean, if Lou and I had still been there, we'd still be back where we were 20 years ago. That's not where we want to be. It's not where it's going. And I think it's been partly this new generation that's been trained, like Claire at the Institute, taking on and providing the leadership. And with national health insurance finally passed, I can't believe they try to criticize it by calling it Obamacare, oh, which is not its name. But, you know, there's going to be a whole decade or two decades of analysis of what's working, what isn't working, how do these yep. insurance uh, things by state work. And so there's a, a greater need than ever because everybody knows that we can't afford to be spending 18% of our gross national product on medical care. So your vision of the uh, future of the Institute seems to be very, very much tied to, obviously, what is going to need to be evaluated when, hopefully, health care reform is implemented. And well, and the health disparities issues, I mean, there are the AIDS issues internationally, these, there's the family planning issue still controversial very lately. Uh, so that there's no end to the issues that we continue to need to address. They change, although in some cases they haven't changed as much, family planning being one of those areas. Um, how do you picture, if you do have a picture, the Institute uh, in five or ten years? Claire has told me that she's not going to do this job for more than seven or ten years but I don't know if I believe that, but anyway. Um, can you imagine what the Institute might be like? Do you see it maybe evolving just the way you've described the health policy program evolved in, you know, in response to uh, obviously the health crises and... and um, I think it's up to the people who are there, mm -hmm. not up to us. <laughs> We've talked enough about what we think, and I think you know, the leadership, the faculty, the students, they have to decide what it's going to be like five or ten years from now. But I think one of the important things is that it's in a medical school. And whereas when we were there, you know, they didn't want doctors messing around with health policy, now everybody knows oh, yes. the gigantic issues and that the leadership is going to have to come from doctors. Yep. Uh, if it's going that's to change. the key. Yes. People trust their doctors. Yep. Yep. And so the new, next generation of medical students is going to have to do what Phil did practically by himself, which is to be a doctor taking a leadership in health policy. That It seems to me it's probably doctors and economists are the two that are going to make the big difference. Yeah. One thing I think that is impressive is the connections that people maintain with the Institute over the decades. Right, right. No matter where they are geographically or in the, you know, at a particular point in their career. 
and um, I think that that in large measure had to do with the kind of community you two fostered. Um, you were very receptive and open to change and to ideas. This was never a, a top-down operation. Well, that's right. It was very collegial. By very much. Very that, re that reminds me, in the early days when we were all in one house, there's no way to build comradeship like having only one bathroom for everybody. <laughs> right. and, they, and so everybody has to stand in line. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding about it. We're in a, in a private home and the bathroom. I actually tried to decorate the bathroom once with goofy stuff. <clears throat> but, it, you know, it was... We were very good friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then we I, had two built two buildings, but it was still the same. We were very much <laughs> well. And I together. think the other thing that you know, as you think about various organizations, the other thing that's so critical is that I think we didn't grow too fast. We somehow, you know, no, events that's right. yeah. events impacted us, and and there was always kind of a a bit of, okay, is this the right fit for us, and you know, do we go in this direction? Do, we were opportunistic in the most positive sense of that word. Right. You know, being But we were lucky to do it at a time mm -hmm. when it was like... When you with, could do it. With Al Johnson. I mean, that was... Nobody was doing bioethics when we started. Well, and, and Al then, really created the whole field. I and mean, then Bernie others, Lowe I mean, became the yeah. director of the bioethics yeah. program. Barbara Koenig right. has just come back from Mayo. She's back at UCSF. Oh, is she really? Yeah. in Washington. I mean, Andy yeah, Jamington is the right. director of a bioethics program in the Midwest. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it goes on and yeah. on. So, I, you know, in a certain sense, the right people arrived at the right time. Well, there's no sense. I mean, we both felt we were quite lucky at the time. We, just happened to be doing it at the right time. <laughs>